Well, happy Christian Day. It is also National Working Moms Day. If you're a working mom, we salute you. I learned as a pastor a long time ago, you never ask a mom, do you work? You do ask, do you work outside the home? Because you know at home you're working, right? So however the, the team is working at your house, God bless you. Uh, just keep in mind, if you've got two incomes going, you can live at a higher income level, but be careful with the credit cards and indebtedness because then you have to work. And if you have a child, speaking to the young marrieds, it can create extra hardship and pain. And so we salute the working moms today. That's all y'all. It is also National Girl Scout Day. Hopefully it remains for girls. Amen. Amen. And happy Women's History Month. Wednesday was International Women's Day. It was the day when the White House gives out awards to international women. They gave out 10 awards to 10 women from amazing countries. And then they had to throw in one from Argentina as though Argentina didn't have any amazing women. And this guy was a man. And the only thing he's ever done is help the cause of men who want to be women. That's terrible. So we have an intersection today. Well, pastor, that sounds transphobic. No, it sounds truthphobic. Are you afraid of the truth? You know, if the emperor's not wearing any clothes, you do yourself and no one else, including the emperor, any favors by pretending he's not naked. True? In the Peanuts cartoon, there was one where the little Charlie Brown shot an arrow and missed the target, so he went and drew a target around his arrow. <laughs> In this everybody gets a trophy culture, it's all about just feeling good and not helping people. Putting Band-Aids on cancer does nothing. And castrating children is terrible. It's abusive. Yes. It's terrible. Let your voice be heard. But have no fear, I'm not going to rant and rave about that today. But we do have an intersection with it being Working Moms Day, Women's History Month. We just had International Women's Day. And it being Girl Scout Day, I want to speak on honoring womanhood today. Yeah. We're in a series. We're in a series called Honoring God and More. And so in our text today, we're going to see that women are created in the image of of God. Can I get an amen? amen? Genesis 1, the Bible's first chapter, God speaks to himself as Elohim. He says, Genesis 1, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And you say the creeps too. So God created man, mankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over this fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field, and everything that creeps on the earth. So women were created in the image of God. Guys, one day we'll speak on honoring manhood. That's under attack too. But today... It's Women's Day. It just is. And Mother's Day uh, is a coming, which around here is Women's Day also. All right, chapter 2, verse 18. Chapter 1 is the big picture. It's the macro scope. And now we zoom in away from the telescope to the microscope to see how God did it. He created a man... And then he pulled woman out of the man. He said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. That's verse 18. Then he brings all the animals to them and he names them. 
And then in verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is the first wedding, y'all. God is the father of the bride and the father of the groom. He's the creator of everything, and he's the witness. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is total acceptance. She should be called, whoa, man, <laughs> because she was taken out of man. When man saw the other man, he said, whoa, man. The Hebrew word there is ish. When ish saw isha, he said, isha. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, when you dig into the story, you'll learn the man had a job first before the Lord gave him a wife. Sometimes we get the cart ahead of the horse. So in this case, it was a job, and it was to guard and tend the garden that they lived in. And we know he didn't do a very good job of that. They were tempted by the serpent, who was an apparition of Satan, the enemy of God, to eat the forbidden fruit. And God shows up, and they hide from him. They, clothed, they realized they were naked. They lost their innocence, lost their sense of righteousness, and so they clothed themselves with their own efforts, fig leaf aprons, and they hid themselves when God appeared. And when the Lord called out to them, he said, Adam, where are you? That's a call to repentance. And, of course, they didn't repent. They played the blame game. Adam said, the woman you gave me, she gave me of the fruit, and I ate. One comedian making fun of this story said, no man would turn down a piece of fruit from a naked woman. <laughs> At the time, they did not know they were naked, and... They lost it. Indirectly, Adam blamed God. The woman you gave me, she's the reason why. And the woman said, the devil made me do it. And so the curse of sin was eat of this forbidden fruit. There will be consequences. You will die. So the curse was death. Ultimately, it was uh, returning to the dust. It was thorns. It was uh, working for a living. It was labor in childbirth. It was nakedness, and to remedy the situation for their nakedness, God killed two animals, made clothes out of skins, so blood was shed to cover their nakedness. So Christ fulfilled the curse for us. His blood was shed to cover the nakedness caused by our own sin. He wore a crown of thorns on his head. He labored in agony to bring birth to the church. And he sweated, as it were, great drops of blood for us. And in the midst of this curse or consequences of sin is verse 15 of chapter 3. God said this to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So Adam lost their authority when they yielded to the tempter, and a seed of woman was coming. A seed was coming. Not the seed of man and woman, but a seed of woman was coming who would bruise the head of the devil, take the authority back, his headship would come to an end. And in the process, the seed of woman's heel would be bruised. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Eve, Adam was her name at the time, but after the fall, after these consequences, Genesis chapter 5 says her name was Adam. After the consequences were given, Adam renamed her Eve. So they were the original Adam's family. But who knows, sin breaks up families. And so this curse was given 
to the devil, but a promise given to the woman. And so she conceived her first child, and she said these words. His name was Cain. I have gotten a man from the Lord. And then she had a second child, Abel. And, of course, Cain proved out not to be a man from the Lord. (laughs) Killed his brother Abel. It was a great disappointment. Then she conceived and had a third child, named him Seth. And she said, I have gotten another man from the Lord. Why was she saying that? She's looking for this promised seed that would bring back the innocence, bring back the righteousness, bring back the order, even in her own home. Seth was not that, but after Seth was born, then mankind began to call on the name of the Lord. Prayer and the call for salvation began with the birth of Seth. So fast forward centuries later, in Bethlehem is a virgin named Mary, who gives birth to the seed of woman. Man had nothing to do with his birth. An angel we celebrated every year during the Christmas season, an angel visited Mary and told her the Holy Spirit would overshadow her and she would give birth to the Messiah. She responded, be it unto me according to your word. So she received the word into her body, into her heart, through her ears. Faith is born by hearing the word of God. She received it and said, be it unto me. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her and brought that word to life in her womb. So as a virgin, she conceived and the seed of woman was born. Why is this significant? Well, God in his mercy limited the passing down of iniquity to be something that's done through the fathers. The iniquity of the fathers is passed down to the children to the third and fourth generation. But the blessing of the righteous is passed down to a thousand generations. So there's a limitation on the iniquity that's passed down through the fathers. So if Jesus had an earthly father, he would not be sinless. But having an earthly mother, it was possible because God was his father. Now there's an effort made by a very large denomination to say Mary was sinless and they had to do something immaculate with her birth because Jesus had to be sinless. Right, Jesus did have to be sinless, but they need to read their Bibles. Sin is passed down through the fathers, not through the mothers. How it happens. Of course, every mother had a father, so there you go. We can't escape it. But Christ came as a seed of woman, born without sin, to pay the ultimate penalty for our sin. And in the process of dying, hanging on three nails... And being beaten brutally, bruised all over, one of his heels was bruised significantly, fulfilling the promise. Isn't that beautiful? And a woman was involved in that. She was there. Didn't abandon him. He had to send her away with John. We're talking about honoring womanhood today. In chapter 5, here's proof right here. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him, male and female, created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Some Bibles will say mankind, but they missed the point. She was honored with the same name the first being was given, Adam, which means red. She had the same red blood in her veins. We're talking about honoring womanhood today. In the Old Testament, I've listed 20. You may want to get your camera and take pictures of these ladies and and, uh, research these ladies. Of course, Eve or Mrs. Adam was her first name. She's definitely a heroine of the faith because she was looking for the Redeemer. She messed up, but she's looking for the fix-up, Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, Sarah, a woman of faith, conceived a child in her old age. Through her came the lineage that would bring about the birth of the Messiah, Rebecca, her daughter-in-law, who was willing to water someone's camels without assurance of being paid. She was willing to work to help somebody else, a weary traveler. And who knows, camels can drink a lot. And then Leah, who was Jacob's least favorite wife, but his best wife. And then Rachel, his favorite wife. Leah brought Judah into the world through whom... The Messiah came, 
And Rachel brought Joseph into the world through whom the lineage of the family was saved. Then there's Tamar. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> then there's Jochebed, the mother of Moses. What a courageous woman. There's Miriam, his sister. What a courageous woman. We don't know that Miriam ever married. There's Rahab, a former prostitute who risked her neck to save the Jewish nation, to spare the lives of the, of the spies. Then there's Deborah, the judge, who was used mightily to keep Israel alive. It's not known whether or not she was married. Generally in the scriptures, if a woman is married, it'll give the name of her husband. It's a very patriarchal book, the Bible is. But it honors women as well. Then there's Jael, the woman who during the reign of Deborah used a tent peg to bring an end to the life of the enemy general. He showed up at her tent. She said, have a nap. Here's some warm milk. He fell asleep. She took a tent peg and drove it through his temple, bringing an end to some chaos. There's Naomi who took Ruth in under her wing, a Moabite girl who said, your God shall be my God and your people shall be my people. And through her, the Messiah came into the world. There's Hannah who gave birth to Samuel who became a mighty man of God who anointed David king through whom the Messiah would come. There's Abigail, an amazing woman, one of David's wives. Bathsheba, an amazing woman who had some things not amazing in her life, but through her came Solomon and another son named Nathan as well as other children. And through Nathan came the family of Mary and through Solomon came the family of Joseph. And thus through the tribe of Judah on both sides, we have the Messiah born, fulfillment of the prophecies given to David, that he would have a king rule in his place whose kingdom would never end. There's Jehoshaphat, who's a heroine of faith. She risked her neck to save the life of a young prince from being destroyed by an evil queen. There's Isaiah's wife. We don't know her name, but she's called a prophetess. There's Holda the prophetess, who ministered the truth. And it's a, you want to read an amazing prophecy. It was not good news for the nation of Israel, but it was good news for Josiah. The young king would bring about a lot of reforms, but then the nation would fall back and they wound up in captivity, fulfillment of prophecy. Queen Esther, we just celebrated Purim. The Jewish people did this week. What a glorious story. Scary story. A significant story. She's not to be forgotten. These are awesome women. Well, the, the First Testament has its heroines, but the New Testament is not without its heroines. We have Elizabeth, who in her old age gave birth to John, the prophet, who would be the forerunner of Jesus. Then we have the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, and four other sons and at least two daughters. We have Anna, the prophetess, who waited for years to be able to give a word that she gave to the Christ child. We have Martha the sister of Lazarus, who waited on Jesus' hand and foot. We have Mary, her sister, who sat at Jesus' feet and didn't wait on him so much. Uh, we have Mary, the mother of James the Less, and Salome, the mother of James and John. Salome is also the name of Herod's stepdaughter who did the dance and brought about the end of John the Baptist's life, but Salome is still a good name. We have Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus had cast seven demons. A tradition says she's a prostitute, but the Bible doesn't say that. She could have been, but she was from Magdala, hence the name Mary Magdalene. There's so many Marys in the Bible that uh, we have to distinguish them to understand which one it is. The name Mary itself is interesting. It comes from the word Mira, Miriam, Mary, and it comes from Israel's experience when they went from Egypt into the wilderness. They crossed the Red Sea miraculously. They're getting thirsty one day, and they arrive at the banks of a lake, as it were, of bitter water. And the people began to murmur and complain. And the waters were called the waters of Mira. Mira means bitter. Mary, in its original form, means bitter. <gasps> Why so many named bitter? Well, listen to what happened. Moses prayed, and God showed a tree to him. He said, cut that tree down cast it in the waters, and the waters will be healed. So Mira, being bitter, became sweet. 
Can you say transformation? So the name Mara, Mary, Mara, Miriam, <laughs> Maria point to transformation. Who knows there's a tree? There's a tree that makes bitter water sweet. We're talking about the cross. There's Joanna, who's one of the women that ministered to Jesus. There's Susanna, one of the women that ministered to Jesus. Do you know to this day there's still a prayer that some Jews pray, a blessing that men pray? Thank you, God, that you've not made me a Gentile. Thank you, God, that you've not made me a slave. And thank you, God, that you've not made me a woman. Still today, and they'll, you can Google it. They, they go to great lengths to try to defend it. It's not in the Bible, of course, but it is a tradition. Jesus never held to traditions that put women down. He lifted women up, and they were very much a part of his story. In the spreading of the gospel, through, primarily through the ministry of Paul, because Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, that's our main history book of the early church, uh, Luke traveled with Paul, part of his team. So you have Lydia, the woman in Philippi, the seller of purple, out of whose home the church was born. You have a woman named Lois, who was Timothy's grandmother. Timothy was Paul's young protege. Her daughter Eunice, a name like Eunice, Timothy's mother. They uh, raised him in the ways of the Lord. He became a mighty man of God, eventually the pastor of the church in Ephesus. There's Chloe that Paul mentions in Rome. Chloe's like a house church leader. She's a deaconess. She's a leader in the church. There's Priscilla, the wife of Aquila. Her and Aquila helped disciple a man named Apollos. Uh, There's Philip's four daughters. They prophesied. There's Phoebe or Phoebe. She's a deaconess. The word deacon or deaconess means a minister. There's Julia who's mentioned in Paul's letters, there's Nerea's sister, we don't know her name, and there's John Mark's mother, who happens to be Barnabas' sister, who traveled with Paul for a while and then went back home to his mama, and Paul and Barnabas split over that because John Mark wanted to rejoin them, and Paul didn't want to, so they formed two apostolic teams. Anyway, John Mark was somehow also related to Peter, and he wrote the Gospel of Mark. Can you say mighty women? Mighty. In church history, there's amazing women. One of the most amazing to me I've just learned about recently is Katharina Bonbora. That was her maiden name, Luther, or known as Katie. She was a nun who defected from a nunnery with other fellow nuns and joined the Reformation. And Luther and his guys helped find them husbands. And she's the last one to find a husband. And she would turn down their offers. And she named two guys that she would be willing to marry. And one of them was Luther. He married her. And she called him uh, Sir. And he called her Lord. (laughs) And she was called the Lutheress. She was a powerful woman. She oversaw the livestock. She oversaw the housing. She oversaw the the revamping of the properties to facilitate the Reformation there in Wittenberg. And she helped her husband prosper. And she had six children, two of whom died and a miscarriage, and raised four orphans, one of whom was a nephew. An amazing woman. But when her husband died, she did not heed his counsel. She figured, he's gone I can do what I want. He told her, when I die, my salary is going to stop, right? So to support yourself, sell all these properties. She didn't do it. And she had to flee because of war and conflicts and had to flee again because of disease and then had to flee again for her own life and wound up falling in a ditch, got sick. It was a ditch full of water, got sick and never recovered and died in her early 50s. Penniless. So, uh, let your spouse know your wishes when you pass and seek wise counsel if your spouse does pass. Do not disregard their word. Anyway, it's a lesson you can learn from her. There's Olympia Fulvia Marada. There's Ann Dutton who wrote letters 
frequently debating with John Wesley. She was called a hyper-Calvinist, but she was such a gracious woman. So take pictures of these. You may want to research these people. Of course, you know who Harriet Tubman is, the conductor of the Underground Railroad. Harriet Beecher Stowe, the lady who um, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is one of the major contributors to slavery being brought to an end. She was the sister to Henry Ward Beecher, whose church took a trip to the Holy Land, and Mark Twain rode with them. And daily he wrote reports while there to send back to newspapers that were published on the state of Israel at the time. And not only were there newspapers, when he came back, they compiled them into a book and hired teams of agents to go across the nation selling this book. And so God used Mark Twain to help spread the word of what bad shape the Holy Land was in so that the world today can see the contrast of what happened when they returned home. He said the Holy Land was a bunch of mosquitoes and swamps and untended to desert. Anyway, so she was no, no doubt a great influence to her brother, Henry Ward Beecher. Fanny Crosby, a, a blind lady who wrote so many songs that to keep people from balking at having songbooks filled with just her, she had a, one or two other pen names that she wrote under as well. Very prolific. Amy Carmichael, a lady that loved India, even though she was physically ill, and she was used mildly by God in rescuing girls from being forced into prostitution. Lilius Trotter, I, I spoke about her a few months back, an amazing woman who set up a missions base in spite of her own physical difficulties in North Africa to help Muslim women who in their elder years were rejected by, by their husbands because they, they could marry a young model. And these women were neglected and unhappy, and they were ripe for the gospel. And so when she died, she left behind like a team of 50 people serving in North Africa. Florence Nightingale, a nurse, we know who she is, uh, helped further the cause of tending to wounded people. Clara Barton, through whom came the Red Cross, which is not exactly what she intended it to become. But these were all women of God. Can you say Christians? Christians. Happy Christian Day. There's Evangeline Corey Booth, a woman preacher, <gasps> who with her husband started the Salvation Army and used innovative means. The first recorded preaching we have is from the Salvation Army, as far as the audio recordings is going, is gone. Lottie Moon, a Southern Baptist woman missionary to China. Hello, Baptist. Yeah. Hello, you're kicking out Rick Warren over the woman, the woman preacher thing when here's someone whose name you use every year to raise funds for missions who is used mildly for God. I'm getting ahead of myself. These other names, Corey Tinboom, she's known for, you know, being in the family that helped rescue Jews. But what a lot, of, a lot of people don't understand is after World War II, she used resources that she had before she began traveling the world, be, being God's tramp for the Lord, preaching on reconciliation. She had two or three facilities that she converted to places to take in Nazis to help them recover from the horror that they had been through and had been involved with. Elizabeth Elliot, her husband was killed by cannibals, remember? She never got bitter. She became a mighty voice. Mother Teresa, you know who she is. Susan B. Anthony, you think of the silver dollar. Well, she did a lot. Frida Lindsay, who took a small Bible college after her husband's death, Gordon, called Christ for the Nations and led it to become the mighty force that it is today. Yes. Kay Smith, who's heard of Chuck Smith? Yeah. He pastored in a certain denomination and they had finally arrived. Uh, some of the churches struggled, and it you know, wasn't a very successful pastor. They finally began to succeed in pastoring, and Chuck felt led to go to Costa Mesa to this small independent church, not part of the denomination, to be pastor there. And his wife said, no, we can't do that. We're finally, we've suffered enough. We're doing fine. Why would God do that? That's not God. And so he prayed, said, Lord, deal with your daughter. And one day he came home and she had been weeping. He said, what's wrong? She says, the Lord told me I need to let you lead the family. If we're to do this moving thing, we'll do it. But don't tell me about it, the details. I don't want to be involved in the details. 
I'll just go along with it because you're the leader. He said, good, because I've got a meeting tonight to go to. (laughs) And so Calvary Chapel happened in their life. And then it was through her influence, her burden for hippies, that the Jesus movement was born. It would not have happened the way it did were it not for her working on her husband. Please. You know, they just need a bath. That was his attitude. That literally was his attitude. There's an interesting Gray Glory interview of Chuck Smith from maybe 10 years back or so that you can find on YouTube to watch the mentality he was. So this is a mighty woman. Some of you may be here today because of this woman. Can you say womanhood? Womanhood. Women in the ministry of Jesus. You may overlook this, so I'm helping you not overlook it. And Luke 8, 1 says the 12 were with him, with Jesus. We know who those guys were. And certain women, can you say plural? plural, who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's servant, and Susanna, and many others. Can you say many? Many others who provided for him from their possessions or from their substance. They were not his girlfriends, but they were part of his team. Because when you're healing the sick and you're preaching the truth, who knows you get hungry. And so those ladies help fill the holes in the net because he's got a bunch of goofy men with him that are busy already. And so they were definitely part of his team. When he suffered and died, a great multitude of the people followed him and women who also mourned and lamented him. In Matthew 27, 55, talking about the same instance, and many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him who were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons, which we see is Salome, James and John. In Mark 15, the same instance in the story of Jesus, there were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, and of Joseph, and Salome, that's the mother of James and John, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. In John 20 and John 21 are two verses one verse in each, that says if everything Jesus did was recorded, the world couldn't handle the books. So where would these women's story be in those books that never got written? God knows we've got enough Bible to go on. Amen? Amen. And so they are mentioned. We're talking about honoring womanhood today, which leads us to this question. Do women really have to be quiet in church? We're going to deal with this today. Please don't leave mad. Hear me out. This teaching is based on two passages of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34 says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as also the law also said, as the law also says, and if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Now, if you want to translate this properly, the word for women, gune, means wives. So read it like this. Let your women keep silent in the assemblies. If this is written to Corinth. There was one church in Corinth. So churches, like we think of churches, plural churches, you know, there's 50 plus churches in this area. It's assembly. So this church, this congregation has multiple assemblies every Sunday morning. So he's saying, let your wives be quiet in the assemblies. So something's going on in their assemblies, right? It has to be that. Otherwise, a woman can't say anything when she enters a church building. You know, they didn't have official church buildings back anyway. For they're not permitted to speak, but to be submissive as the law also says. Now, the law says nothing. Get your best concordance. The law says nothing about women being quiet. But it does speak of men 
being head of the home. In fact, part of the curse of the law is a part of the curse of sin is a husband shall rule over his wife, but the wife's desire will be also to, to rule. So you got this conflict going on, and the Lord laughs and says, the two shall be one. So it takes his involvement for a marriage to succeed. It really does, where they're not trying to dominate each other. So in this instance, the law points to order in the home, but not to silence. Otherwise, they'd have to be silent at home, right? And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. So this isn't women submitting to men. This is wives and husbands, their relationship. So if they're going to have Bible studies, don't do it in the middle of a gathering. You see that? For it is shameful for wives to speak in assemblies. So there's something going on there. Anytime you take a passage of Scripture literally and it contradicts other Scriptures, you got to back off and have another look at it. Corinthians itself, this same letter, talks about women praying and prophesying in public, having their heads covered, being under the authority of their husbands. Why would Paul negate, even in this very chapter, about people prophesying and exercising in the gifts, why would he negate that by saying, now the women can't operate in the gifts? See what I'm saying? Now, people in our current day, highly respected scholars that really hammer down on this don't see the contradiction because they're cessationists. They believe the gifts of the Spirit aren't for today, so that's not their problem. In fact, in reading this chapter, they'll explain away everything in the chapter except these verses. It's the truth. Guys, I like to listen to. They're wrong on this. And their accusation, well, you're just compromising with the LGBT movement, that's not true. I have believed this since I was a child. Having served as missionaries, my parents, I went with them in their house, in two different countries where the first missionaries were women who had started churches. Now, how can you start a church and be silent? (laughs) And look at it like this. If it's just women, all women and not wives, then a single woman doesn't have a husband at home. A widow doesn't have a husband at home. And it has to do with order in the home. Also, Paul is dealing with disorder in this church. This whole letter is about their disunity and their conflict. And sometimes to settle conflicts, a certain segment of the population may need to be quiet till order is established. So I don't have all the answers, but I know taking it literally creates problems. You want to take Bible literally? Four places in the New Testament says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Hello? Look it up. When we were in Rhodesia, now called Zimbabwe, we came across a denominational pastor from Portugal who was pastoring a denominational church. His last name was Lata. Well, we had to meet him, right? And he invited us to minister at his church. And he took this passage literally. I do not know if it had anything to do with Portuguese culture. But at the end of the service, he stood at the front door shaking everybody's hands, right? But he was kissing all the women on the lips. (laughs) I hope, I hope the kisses were holy. (laughs) You know, there's another verse written to Timothy that says, drink no longer water, but a little wine for your stomach's sake. You're going to take that literally? Then it's a sin to drink water, and then Jesus has sinned by asking the woman at the well for a drink of water. (laughs) Pastor, you're loaded for bear today. I am. There's a brochure in your bulletin. I hate it that we ran out of bulletins. (laughs) But outside to the right of the information desk 
is a track rack of stuff I've written. And I freshly filled it this week with this one. Do women really have to be quiet in church? Now, this isn't the only passage where this is dealt with. 1 Timothy 2.11 says, let a woman or a wife, keep in mind this, is, this means wife, let a wife or woman learn in silence with all submission. What does that mean? It has to do with order in the home. And I did not permit a wife to teach or have authority over a man or a husband, but to be in silence. And then he gives his reasoning, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. So what were they? They were the first couple. So this is universal for us all, that the husband should be the head of the home, but it's not a, a headship that's dominating or cruel or passing the blood. buck. Adam dropped the ball by not guarding the garden, and he dropped the ball by not covering for his wife, by blaming her for the problem, and then distancing himself from her by labeling her Eve just like he had the animals. Adam was formed first. He was the older one. He was held accountable. Then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived. Deceived fell into transgression. So she was deceived, but the man was a slacker. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. What? If you take this literally, then women can't be saved unless they have babies. What's a barren woman to do? What's a widow to do? What's a, a single woman to do? See the distortion you have by taking everything literal? Sometimes you have to look at it from a distance. I believe with all my heart the Bible is the Word of God. Holy men of God wrote as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what they wrote in their own words through their own personalities. So Paul isn't saying that. You know, English is the second language translated from the Greek. You're going to have to look at it again in other versions. Because that is heresy to say a woman can't be saved unless she has children. See what I mean? And these morons, yes, I call you guys morons for not thinking, just wanted to hold to your tradition out of pride and not looking in the mirror and holding to the truth. And you're the ones actually paving the way for the LGBT movement to make progress in the culture. Because you're, you're contaminating the right division of God's word with your tradition and not looking at the real thing. <laughs> Women are not saved by childbearing. I'm sorry, that's not true. It's saved by the childbearing that, that Mary did. <laughs> the Son of God saves. We're not saved by works. And let me say this, if you believe the law says women have to be silent because Paul wrote it, Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. He fulfilled the law. So what does this mean? Well, let's just look at two other versions. The amplified version for verse 15, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. The Amplified Version says, Nevertheless, the sentence put upon women of pain in motherhood does not hinder their soul's salvation, and they will be saved eternally if they continue in faith and love and holiness and self-control, saved indeed through the childbearing or by the birth of the divine child. Hallelujah. Now keep in mind, Paul isn't the only one writing letters. People are writing letters back to them, back to him, and he's addressing heresies. There's a form of Gnosticism at the time that had the story of Adam and his wife completely reversed. So he straightened out that story as well. The Message Bible says this for 1 Timothy 2.15. On the other hand, her childbearing brought about salvation, reversing Eve. But this salvation only comes to those who continue in faith, love, and holiness, gathering it all unto maturity. You can depend on this. Yes, but aren't we supposed to take the Word of God literally? Yes, we are. But we are told to study to show ourselves approved 
unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth, making sure we understand its context. Looking at these verses out of context creates this literal oversimplification. And you do not take everything literal in life. A few years ago, a brother and I took two younger brothers, or I went along, to a Rangers baseball game. And the older brother, not older than me, but older than the two younger brothers, gave one of them a $20 bill and said, go buy us some pretzels. So that boy, taking him literally, came back with $20 worth of pretzels. <laughs> which created a situation, two problems, no change for the generous friend and no beverages to go along with the salty pretzels. <laughs> so it made us thirsty. He took it literally. He did what he was told, right? Take this literal. Mark ends with these, verse, these words. Uh, these signs shall follow those that believe. They'll lay hands on the sick. They'll recover. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it shall not harm them. You know, there's churches and there's hillbilly churches up in the Appalachia area of America that handle snakes because they take that verse literally. And they got one other verse that says you'll tread up on serpents and scorpions. So I don't know if they stomp on scorpions or put their bare feet on them. But they play with snakes, and eventually they die. And when questioned, they'll say, don't you have the faith? Don't you obey the word of God? Look what the Bible says. They shall take up serpents, and we shall take up serpents. You take it literal. So who's a more obedient? The person that takes everything in the Bible literal or the person that uses their head and studies and makes sure their interpretation doesn't contradict other verses. And don't avoid these issues by saying those things are passed away today. No, they're not passed away. They're for us today. I know some continuationists have taken things too far, but that doesn't do away with the fact the gifts of the Spirit are still for us today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for our sisters. I thank you, Lord, for my wife, daughter of the king, my sister in Christ, my friend. Thank you, Lord, for bringing her into my life 45 plus years ago. I pray, Lord, you'd bless her beyond her dreams. And Lord, I pray the same for every sister in this room. Lord, where they have been hurt by the church, I pray, Lord, that you would bring healing to their heart. Lord, if we've hurt them here, Lord, may they be bold to come and confront in love, hopefully. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for the body of Christ in which there's neither male nor female, nor slave nor free, but we are all one in you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your kingdom. And now, Lord, as we worship you, we recognize you've called us to do a great task for you. In Jesus' name. And Lord, as Yvette exhorted us earlier, Lord, may we all hear your voice of affirmation to be what you've called us to be, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you've called us accepted. Thank you, Lord, that you've called us righteous. Thank you, Lord, that you've called us to be holy. And you've called us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Thank you, Lord, for the part we have to play in that. In Jesus' name, we give you all the praise and honor. Amen.
singing um, in John 4 Jesus and the disciples head off and they go through Samaria and you know this you know the story listen to this now Jacob's well was there Jesus therefore being wearied from his journey sat thus by the well it was about the sixth hour you know the story that happens from there he gets into a dialogue with this woman who is not living her best life now, to say the least. But he talks to her, and at the end of that, guess what happens after 
after this great dialogue. It's a, a dialogue of Jesus restoration. And at the end of that, guess what happens? She runs into the city and she becomes, brothers and sisters, she becomes the first evangelist. Hallelujah, hallelujah, isn't that cool? What an act of restoration. And it's interesting because when we sing this song, I'll rest right here with you. That's exactly what Jesus did. He sat down to rest and he rested with the woman. What an awesome picture. Jesus is ready to rest with you. And through his resting with you, there is restoration for you. Hallelujah. second woman of angels is Mary Magdalene. She's the first witness of the resurrection that went to tell. They didn't believe her because she's a woman, but they probably wouldn't have believed a man either. <laughs> it seems so far fetched and the Lord appeared to them and proved himself to be alive. Ten days after his ascension, the church was born during Shavuot, the day of Pentecost. And God poured out his spirit on men and women, speaking in multiple languages, declaring the wonderful works of God. Peter stands up to preach to give an explanation and quotes from Joel 2. So both Joel 2 and Acts 2 have these words. That in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And sons and daughters will prophesy. Will I pour out of my spirit in those days on your maid servants and your men servants, male and female again, and they shall prophesy. Now those who say that prophecy is done away with definitely believe in preaching, and they say that's modern day prophecy is preaching. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 that prophesying is speaking words of edification, that's building up, exhortation that's calling up and comfort that's calming down so when you speak words that are inspired by the Lord that build up people or call up people to a higher level of living or calm people down from life's frustrations those are prophetic utterances and men and women can do that it's in the Bible so Paul did not mean have you ever been taken out of context? He did, not, he did not mean what people are doing with his words by taking them out of context of the overall revelation of the book of 1 Corinthians 
as well as the New Testament itself. Lord, we pray that you would fill sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, fill maidservants with your spirit. Release them to prophesy. To speak words of edification, to build others up. To speak words of exhortation, to call others up. To speak words of comfort, to calm people down. Lord, we live in a sin-sick world, a rattled, frustrated, high-pressure culture. Lord, we pray that you'd use our sisters mightily, that they will be silenced no more. And Lord, we pray for a fresh level of harmony and unity in the home as husbands serve their wives and enable them to come into their fullness. All right, ladies, just receive this prayer right now. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled to prophesy. Be filled to flow in spiritual gifts. Be filled to build people up. Be filled to call them up. Be filled to bring comfort to others. Let's receive. I'm seen, I know, I'm loved by my Father. I'm seen, I know, I'm loved. By my Father, I know I'm loved. By my Father, I know I'm loved. said, he who receives you receives me. Amen. The position we stand in is, as believers are agents of the kingdom of God, members of the body of Christ. So whoever allows you to minister to them, they're allowing Jesus to minister to them. Amen. Then he went on to say, whoever receives me, receives him who sent me, which means Whoever received ministry from Jesus will receive a ministry from the Father. Then he said, whoever received a prophet in the name of a prophet receives a prophet's reward. What is that? It means if you receive a prophet as a prophet, then that prophet is able to be a prophet and you'll benefit from the ministry of that prophet, right? Then he went on to say, whoever receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. What does that mean? If we relate to one another on the level of our righteousness, we'll enjoy the benefit of relating to righteous people. So we do not look to one another through the eyes of the past, but through the eyes of the destiny the Lord has given us. Yes, through the eyes of Jesus. He sees us as living stones. He said, whoever receives a little one in the name of a disciple, who knows children are not yet full-grown disciples, right? But if we relate to children as though they were full-grown children, we'll by no means lose our reward. In other words, that child will have an environment in which they can prosper and be healthy spiritually. You see that? You ever go to a family reunion where people look at you through the eyes of the past? You're not really able to fully be yourself. It's my prayer that the body of Christ, especially this congregation, relates to itself. We relate to one another as though we were fully developed disciples with respect and honor so that we can arise to the occasion and be all that God has called us to be. That's not pride. That's the will of God. The Lord bless you and keep you 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. The peace that is shalom peace, that whole peace that is based on Calvary's conquest and not on man's compromise. Receive it. Receive it. Be agents of that peace. Be what God has called you to be. Don't let gender hold you back. Tell the truth in love. Go get them, tigers. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah.